I know that's a miracle today. Amen. So I'm grateful that the Lord has seen fit to have her with me. I think I preach just a little bit better when my wife is with me. I believe Pastor knows what I'm talking about. Why don't you just put your hands together tonight for Pastor Troy Levy. Amen. We praise God for his dynamic leadership, for his vision and ministry. I don't know about you, but as I was driving here, I saw the Statue of Liberty, saw the New York skyline, I saw people playing basketball, and all of these places were highly attractive. But I, I've come to say this evening that there is no place like this place, and you are in the right place tonight. The next two weeks, we are going to seek to hear what God has revealed to us from his word. It won't be what the preacher said. It won't be what you heard. We're going to hear what thus saith the Lord. And I charge you night after night to bring your word or to bring your cell phone or to bring your iPad or your tablet. And if you keep coming, you just might win one of those. And download the Bible app and we're going to seek to hear deep truths straight from the word of God. I don't know about you, but I wish I could sing like these young people behind me. What do you say? The Bible says make a joyful noise with the Lord, but they didn't make a noise. They sounded good. We praise God for all of you. If, you ever, if you're like me, you sing in private places, uh, in the shower, when you're driving by yourself. Uh, you may be able to do a good run once, but you can't do it again like my brother over here. So we praise God for their skill and their willingness to use their gifts and talents for the word. What do you say? Well, I thank you all for coming, whether you heard it on the radio, or whether you heard it from the friend, or whether something just moved and you found yourself in the pew. We're glad you're here tonight, from the youngest to the oldest. And without further ado, we want to go straight to the word tonight. So if you have your Bibles, let me see them in the air. If you have your Bibles, let me see them in the air. And we've come to do battle. What did I say? We've come to do battle. So I want you to repeat after me, devil, devil. get out of here. Oh, so you, you said it like you were friends with the devil. Come on, say it like you're enemies. Devil, devil. get out of here. I got my weapon. It's locked and loaded. I'm ready to use it. Now come on, let's say it one more time. Devil, get out of here. I got my weapon. It's locked and loaded. And I'm ready to use it. Come on, let's go together to Daniel chapter 2. The book of Daniel, that's in the Old Testament. Chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2. And from here we will take our first passage of scripture. And I'm excited to hear and see what God has in store for us. We want to let you know that at the end of each nightly service, we will be having special prayer. If you've got prayer requests, family, finances, sickness, or whatever it is, please stay after us. We want to have special prayer for and with you. And listen, I, I'm a young man, but I like to think that I, I'm an old man in a young man's body. And my mom taught me that you ought to learn people's names if you get the opportunity. So before you all leave, I'll meet you in the back there. I want to know your name. Now, forgive me, there's a lot of you in one of me. So in order for me to get to know your name and it would lock in my long-term memory, you're going to have to come back. Now, if you only come tonight and I see you in the corner store or in the Walmart or something like that, you say, Pastor, what's going on? I don't remember your name. I'm going to say, well, did you come once? But if you keep on coming, I promise your name will be downloaded in my mind. Because I don't just want to say, hey, ma'am, hey, sir, what's up, my man? I want to be able to tell what your name is. Is that all right? Amen. amen. Daniel chapter 2, if you're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. Let's go look at verse 17. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 17. We're speaking under the subject tonight, who's really? in control. Amen. Who's really in control? Daniel chapter 2 beginning at verse number 17 the Bible says then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And listen to what he said. Verse 20. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. Sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise. And knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness. And light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. 
you have made known to us the dream of the king. Would you pray with me? Yes. Our Father and our God, we come tonight not with form or for fashion, but to hear from you. I pray, O oh God, that you will please perform a miracle. Let heaven and earth kiss in this moment. Tune our ears and hearts into the frequency of heaven, and may there be a clear signal, for we would hear from you. My prayer tonight is that it will be less of I and none of me, but more of you and all of thee. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. One of the memories that is fond to me is from my childhood. My grandmother passed away in 1999, but praise God, I have wonderful memories of my grandmother. You know, my grandma could cook. I don't know about you, but you, like me, might have a grandma who sure enough knows how to throw down. And incidentally, although my grandma, born in Georgia from the South, knew how to cook wonderful desserts and wonderful meals, cornbread, and collard greens, and mac and cheese, my favorite item to eat from my grandmother was actually quite simple. Turkey and cheese sandwich. I could make it, my mom could make it, my dad could make it, but there was something special about grandma's touch on a turkey and cheese sandwich. Well, that's not my fondest memory of grandma. It was actually one evening when she sat me down in her living room. Grandma had a small house. It was one of those houses that you could kind of walk through the front and the back door seemingly at one step. It was the house where my father and all seven of his siblings were reared. And she stayed in this house until the day she died. She sat me down in her small living room on one side of the living room, and there she was on the other. And she said, I'll tell you what her nickname was for me if you promise not to laugh. She said, Poo Poo. <laughs> oh, see, I thought y'all wasn't going to laugh. That was her nickname for me, and I love it. She said, Poo Poo, go get that Bible over there on the fireplace. I went and got the Bible, and she said, you sit there, and I'm going to go over here. I said, Grandma, where's your Bible? She said, no, I don't need the Bible. You, 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 you hold on to it. So then she said to me, this is what we're going to do. I was probably only seven or eight years old. She said, I'm going to call out a passage of Scripture. And I want you to go to it and find it. And then I want you to tell me if I say it from memory correctly. So at seven or eight years old, I had the Bible. And I just knew that I was going to win this game. I sat down and opened that old, torn, and worn Bible with pencil and pen markings and different color highlighters all over it. Certain pages were ripped off and placed back in in the correct places. She had notes and telephone numbers in the back. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Old Bible. You could tell it had been used. And she said, all right, you ready? I said, yeah, Grandma, I'm ready. She said, open to Genesis 1 and verse 1. I said, now, Grandma, that's not fair. That's the first verse of the Bible. Everybody knows that. She said, open up to it. I went to it. She said, you ready? I said, yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I said, you're right. That was too easy. She said, all right, go to John 3.16. So I scurried over to John 3.16. I said, I'm ready. She said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I said, wow, Grandma, that's good. You got two? You got anything else? She said, yeah, go over to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Scurried over there. I said, I'm there. Go ahead, Grandma. And she said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. She said, stay in that same book and chapter and go a few verses later, verse 19. I said, I'm there. She said, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Now she said, go back over to the Old Testament to Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. I went back there and I said, I'm there. She said, for I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and an expected end. And no kidding, for the space of about 20 minutes, my grandmother sat with her eyes closed in her rocking chair and recited to me passage after passage after passage after passage. Amen. And at the end of it all, I said, Grandma, why did you do this and how did it come to pass? And she quoted one more passage in my hearing. She says, grandson, the Bible says, I have hidden my, thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And in that moment, the Bible became meaningful to me on a personal level. And it all started in a little small living room, sitting across from my aged grandmother. And for 20 minutes, seeing her rehearse passage after passage after passage. 
You know, my friends, the fact is that God has revealed something to us in his word. From Genesis to Revelation, we see powerful things, wonderful stories, deep and pervasive words of wisdom that are not just ancient and for times past, but I've come to learn that what is in between these two covers is meaningful for life today. What do you say? In fact, I want you to listen and go to, with your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you got your Bibles, go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And when you have it, let me know by saying amen. amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, that's a New Testament book. We're coming back to Daniel, but I want to listen, want you to listen to what 2 Timothy chapter 3 says. When you have it, let me know by saying amen. amen. Listen to what it says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. The Bible says all scripture, how much everybody? All, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for what everybody? Teaching. For rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the man or woman, and I'll add boy and girl of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. The Bible says that there is a multifaceted purpose to the word of God. 2 Timothy says it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness. And at least one of these I know by personal experience. I could not stand when I did something that was not pleasing to my mother and father. And they would go and get the word of God to support them. Especially when I did something that time out couldn't handle. And they said, go in the closet and get that belt. And you can't say that too much, and I don't know if they come get parents nowadays for what they used to do to me when I was younger. Amen. But I said, this is not right. God cannot be pleased at this. And they say, the Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child. What I learned is this. I didn't like that text, but it did do some correcting, and I have some bruises to prove it. And I know that you do too. The Bible says that it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, and training in righteousness. But I love what it says at the beginning, that this is not a book that was composed by man in isolation. But it says that it is God-breathed. Yeah. Inspired is the big word that you've often heard. This is a result of an action chosen by God. He said, I need to leave something for my children to be able to find me in. So he breathed this word that we have, useful for teaching, rebuking, training in righteousness. I wondered, like you, well, does it have a start and an end date? Most everything we know has some kind of expiration date. These light bulbs above us, if they stay on long enough, they will go out. If you drive long enough without stopping at the gas station, guess what? Your gas will run out. If you turn on the lights in your home and run the water without paying the bill, guess what? Your hot water will run out. Everything that we know has an expiration date. My brother back here has his camera and his video recorder. But if he lets it record long enough without charging it, it will run out. You and I have liquids in our refrigerator that have expiration dates on it. And if we let it stay longer than it's supposed to, it will expire. But the good news is the Bible has no expiration date. Yeah. It is always relevant. It is always powerful. It always has something for you and for me. But I don't just want you to take my word for it. I want you to take the word for it. Isaiah chapter 40. Go there with me. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah says about the word of God. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. Here's what the Bible says. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. You and I, growing up in school, know that every now and then math books and science books and reading composition books have to be updated. That's why on the side panel it'll say first, second, third, fourth edition, which means the content that was good for the first edition has updated. We found out some more things. There are things that were not known then, but now we had to update it. But the good news is there is no need to update God's word. Yeah. Somehow God in his wisdom, when he breathed into this thing, said it will last forever. But I want to show you something else. This is, particular, this is my favorite verse in all scripture. Psalm 119 and verse 9. This is the anchor text that kept me as a teenager from veering to the left and to the right. 
Bible asks some question, how can a young man keep his way pure by living according to God's word? Amen. I wish that I could talk to every young person in this city Amen. to let them know if you want to know how to stay in the lane, live according to God's word. Especially for young black men like myself. Where every now and then we cannot guarantee that we'll leave and come back to our front door in safety. The key to my existence is not my education. It is not the money in my account. But the key to my existence is the word of God. In that same chapter, verse 11, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart, my grandma's text, that I might not sin against you. Verse 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A lamp is to show you what is directly around you, but a light is to show you what is coming ahead. Isn't it amazing that God's word is at one and the same time a lamp and a light to make sure that your footing is sure, but it lets you know the next step you have to take. And if not for the word of God, many of us would have fallen off of the path. Well, let me go ahead and say this. Some of us at one point or another have fallen off the path. But praise God, it wasn't just a lamp, but it was also a light. So that when you deviated from the path, the light was still shining to know where to get back on. Psalm 119 verse 133 then says, direct my footsteps according to your word and let not sin rule over me. Let, let me tell you something, my friends. If we are in these times in which we are living, to hang on to hope and not give up. Because if you look at the news, Amen. turn through the newspaper, Amen. even just stand at the gas station or in the right aisle in the grocery store, you're bound to just overhear something tragic. Senseless violence. People are dying before their ages. Young people, before they are in their 20s, are dying from diseases that in times past were reserved for people who were 50 and 60 and 70. I don't know about you, but there are tragedies abounding Amen. all around. Amen. I'm wondering who's really in control of this thing. The politicians pro uh, promulgate that they are in control. Somebody once said that they, uh, somebody recently has said that they don't just want to be the president of the states, they want to be the president of the world. Amen. People are vying for control on the left and on the right. Celebrities want to be the control, the, the, the uh, they want to be in control of the social media avenues. There are actors and actresses that want to be in control of the big screen. There are, there are people who are not even famous. Car salesmen want to be in control of their market. Everybody is vying for control. Amen. Husbands want to be in control of their houses, and so do wives. Children want to be in control over their parents. But I want to know who's really in control of this world. Yeah. So, the Bible says that if you want to know, you ought to let the Word of God direct your steps. Yeah. And when you read the Word of God, this is who you're looking for. John chapter 5 and verse 39 says it clearly. John chapter 5 and verse 39, when you have it, let me know by saying amen. amen. John chapter 5 and verse 39, Jesus himself tells us the central focal point of Scripture. John 5 and verse 39, listen to the words, it says... You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. But listen how it ends. These are the scriptures that testify about who everybody? Me. Me. So tonight I want to give you something to remember. Any basketball fans in the house? National Basketball Association? Praise God. I won't tell you who my team is. We haven't been doing well the past couple of years. But I will say this. The lead guard of that team used to be, and I think he still is, is Kobe Bryant. So if you don't think my basketball, you know who my team is. We're going to come back. Just pray for us. Well, there was a time where the arch rival team of the Los Angeles Lakers was the Boston Celtics. Boston Celtics and the LA Lakers have this rivalry that dates back all the way to the 70s. Bill Russell, then it went on. Magic Johnson and, and Larry Bird clashed in the 80s. And now it was Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. Well, the Boston Celtics came up with this, this plan, this strategy that other teams have since modeled. They said the only way we're going to beat the Lakers is if we get a big three. Y'all remember they got the big three? They got right Rajon Rondo, Paul Pierce, and Kevin Garnett. Well, I believe tonight, in order for this message to really process, I'm going to give you big three. That's okay? 
You had the victory of tonight's message. This is the purpose of God's word. To reveal to what everybody? To reveal the character of God. To reflect the character of God. And to remind us of the character of God. So tonight if you get nothing else from the preacher. Somebody asked you, where were you tonight? I was down at Bethel. What did he talk about? Well, he talked about the victory of God's word. You can tell them with the same letter word, R, to reveal the character of God, to reflect the character of God, and to remind us of the character of God. I want to say to you tonight that I believe, in summary fashion, that the word of God is God's love letter to you. Amen. Now, I don't want to sound mushy, but I am married. And I found that love letters do work. Yes. You see, when I was gathering up the courage and the boldness to ask my now wife, then friend, to be my girlfriend, I called her aside and I said, listen, she was living in Bermuda at the time where she was born and raised. She was visiting over on stateside and I said, listen, I would love it if you went to Bermuda as my girlfriend. You got five seconds to respond. <laughs> <laughs> She answered right away. I said, you don't need the remaining four. She said, I don't need four more seconds. You need four more seconds? I said, no, that's good with me. But here, the commencement of our relationship was in less than ideal circumstances. It was going to be a long distance relationship. She was going back to Bermuda. I was finishing up my master's at Andrews University in Michigan. And so the distance was somewhere around 1,500 miles apart. And they say that distance makes the heart grow fonder, and that's a little true, but I don't like the distance. And I said, listen, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm going to do everything within my means and resources and power to make sure this distance does not keep us apart always. She said, all right, I'm down. Mutually invested in the relationship. And one of the ways that we kept it interesting and meaningful was whereas we talked on the phone and we text messaged, we would keep journals one for another and allow the other to read them whenever we would come back into each other's presence. And I wish I could tell you that I looked all strong and masculine when sitting on my couch writing my letters. But when her face would come up to my mind, I would just kind of put my chin in my hand and take my journal and pen and begin to write poetry to her. Because I wanted her to know that although we were apart, we were, I was thinking about you. And do you know that this is what God's word is? It is a wonderful love letter breathed by God for you and for I. Growing up, there was a popular movie called The Little Rascals. It came out in 1994. It was based on the television series that was around the 1950s. I won't ask who was around the 1950s to see if you saw it then. But if you were around in 1994, you or someone you know might have seen the movie. The Little Rascals. Strange and awkward little characters such as Spanky and Alfalfa and Buckwheat and Porky and Froggy and all of these characters were there. And the little boys were a part of this very strange club called the He-Man Woman Haters. And there were two central characters. The one there was Alfalfa. That was the guy. Always had this little piece of hair that stuck up. And Alfalfa was conflicted because although he was a member of the He-Man Woman Haters, his heart was in love with Darla. And so the leader of the club, Spanky, had a problem. He said, listen, Alfalfa, you can't love Darla and be a part of the He-Man Woman Haters at the same time. This is not going to work. So now Alfalfa came up with a bright idea. He said, well, I'm going to write a letter to Darla. So now he's writing this letter to Darla. And if you've seen the movie, you'll know the scene I'm talking about. He didn't want to be seen taking the letter to Darla, so we got two of his boys to come and give it to him. But he didn't want his boys to know what he was writing. So he said something that was different than what he was writing. So this is what he said while he was writing it so his boys could hear it. He said, Dear Darla, I hate your stinking guts. You make me vomit. You're the scum between my toes. Love, Alfalfa. Sealed the letter, signed it, and gave it to them to deliver. Well, on the way, one of his little friends, his nose was running. Asked his friend Buckley, he said, man, you got some tissue, Buckley, said, no, I don't got no tissue. He says, okay, I'll use this. So he takes the letter and blows his nose in the letter. They arrive to Darla, and Darla's drinking a pop. 
And they say, God's been wasting my time. He says, no, no, no. Al Alpha gave us a letter to give to you. Buckwheat's looking for it. And then finally, Buckwheat's friend says, uh-oh, <laughs> I blew my nose in the letter. Before they walked away, Buckwheat says, no, 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 no. It's okay. I remember what he said. <laughs> so now in Darla's presence, Buckwheat recites what he heard Al Alpha say. This is what he said. Dear Darla, I hate your stinking guts. You make me vomit. You're the scum between my toes. Love, Alpha. And Darla, filled with rage, crushes the soda can in her hand. But you know, there was a shot on the movie that really shows what was actually in the letter. I have it on the screen. In that letter, if Darla was able to read it for herself, this is what she would have seen. Dear Darla, I can't live without you. Really, I'm not kidding. If she had read it for herself, she would have learned what was in it. But since she only went on what someone said it said, she was upset. I believe that there are some here tonight who for a long time have been upset because of what they heard the word said. But for the next two weeks, my brothers and sisters, we're going to get to look at the love letter for ourselves. We're going to get to spend intimate time in it for ourselves. Reading it, testing it, trying it. And I believe that like Darla, if we read it for ourselves, we'll hear a loving God say, I love you. Can't live without you. Don't want to live without you. And as a sign of my undying love, I wrote you a love letter. Here's my appeal, my brothers and sisters. I want you to think about it. God means so much to me. Not because of all of the blessings that he gives, but because he thought enough of me and he thought enough of you to write me a love letter. I don't know how long he intended it to be, but I think he got a little excited and just kept on going. After Genesis came Exodus and so on and so forth, and he's left us a marvelous love letter. And listen, I commit to you that as I read this love letter, I'm not going to draw things in that are here. We're going to draw things out that are here. Amen. Draw things out that are here. Because I only want to tell you what your loving God has purposed for you to know. Listen, if it's your desire tonight to hear the word of God and nothing more and nothing less, I just want you to stand with me. I just want you to stand with me. I raise my hand because there's something powerful that happens when God's people hear from him. Let me pray for you. God, right now we come thanking you so much for the power of your love. Your love that demands communication and you want to talk to us so bad that you wrote us a letter. Some call it the word of God. Some call it the sword, the spirit. Some call it the holy Bible. But tonight we've learned that it's all those and one more. It is your love letter. And oh God, night after night, we are going to seek to hear words of love, words of revelation from your word. I'm praying, pleading, asking that you will make it plain and make it clear. Now God, I know that whenever the love letter is open, the enemy likes to get busy. God, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke and bind you. May he have no say or sway or power over anyone. I pray, oh God, in heaven that night after night we will be able to come and hear from you. We will be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory. For every person who has stood committing to saying, God, I'm going to come. Because I want to hear what you have written in your letter to me. Lord, I pray that you will make it abundantly clear. May there be no, nothing confused. And I pray that everything from your word will be received and accepted with joy. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. But all who believe, say amen. 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 And amen. amen. Praise
praise God. Praise God. Put your hands together for the word of God tonight. God be praised. God be praised.
to reading, yea, even studying your word for ourselves. Lord, we, where we have neglected reading the word of God, may we be committed right now. If we need to go home tonight, right now, and open up the word of God to read a chapter, or if in the morning before we head off to work, or wherever we are going, we need to open up the word, waking up earlier just to open up your word so that we can find out what's in it, Lord God. Convict us. Give us the strength to study tonight, tomorrow morning, Lord God, and bring us back tomorrow evening so that we can learn another important topic from the word of God. We know that you have something for us. Give us strength to come out tomorrow and also to bring a friend if this has been important to us. So we thank you and we bless you for what you have done. Bless the evangelist. Bless his wife. Continue to, uh, uh, to connect their hearts closer together. And we know that you have something very important planned for them. And we'll be confident to give you all the praise, honor, and glory because it is only to you that it is due. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, no, the ushers aren't going to let you out. You may flow out as you need to. Uh, if you're going to press forward, uh, press forward at this time. If you're going to exit, please exit at this time. I'm going to ask that if the evangelist will come and join me as soon as he can. Our prayer team, uh, our Bible worker, 